The policies of the International Monetary Fund have always been controversial in the Caribbean. Jamaica is back in an IMF program, but many believe that that program will lead Jamaica down the pathway of Greece. Greece is in a lot of trouble. Is this what will happen to Jamaica? More trouble? Stay tuned. Carib Nation is up next. This is Carib Nation Television, the source for news and information about the Caribbean and the diaspora. Seen locally in the Washington, D.C. area on MHZ Network. Sundays at 3.30 p.m. and Wednesdays at 11.30 a.m. And on the World Wide Web at CaribNationTV.com. Carib Nation, the television for one people, one culture, one Caribbean, one nation. Welcome to Carib Nation. I'm Paul Nehru, Tennessee, and today we will be discussing the IMF and the Caribbean. The IMF is the International Monetary Fund, and I have two very distinguished guests today for us to discuss the IMF in the Caribbean. I have on my right Dr. Therese Turner-Jones. She is the Deputy Division Chief of the Caribbean Second Division for the Western Hemisphere Department. Department. Welcome, Doc. Thank you. And Dr. Mark Weisbrook. He's the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy here in Washington, D.C., a very outstanding think tank. Welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's get straight to the point. Mark, you wrote an article about the IMF and Jamaica quite recently, and the leader of the opposition in the Parliament of Jamaica quoted you. Why would she quote you? Well, uh, actually, I wasn't the author of the paper. We published it, though, at, at the Center for Economic and Policy. Well, you must Research. have had something to do with oh, it, yes, knowing I definitely that you did. work there. And, uh, well, I think the paper shows uh, that the IMF played, uh, unfortunately, a, a destructive role in the Jamaican economy and the whole debt exchange that they had in uh, last year, in 2010 really doesn't resolve the problem. Uh, Jamaica just has too much debt. You know, it's 129% of GDP, even after the uh, debt exchange. But worse than that is the, the burden of the debt. You know, in the last five years, uh, Jamaica has paid 13% of GDP in debt service. Now, just to give you an idea, that's what really matters. I mean, you can have a high level of debt, but if your interest rates are low, like Japan, you know, uh, their debt is 220% of GDP. They don't have a problem because it's extremely low interest rates. But the interest rates in Jamaica are so high uh, that this is twice uh, the interest burden that Greece has. And Greece is on the verge of, you know, political meltdown and default. And they're, they're paying 6.5% of GDP. So this is an enormous amount. And in, two, in the last fiscal year, uh, it was actually... Uh, or in uh, 2009, 2010, I think it was, where they actually hit 17% of GDP. So this is a, a classic case where they're trying to squeeze the maximum debt payment out of the country, like they're doing in Greece, Ireland, and Portugal, and Spain, but extreme, it's much more extreme in Jamaica. And it's for years now, it's cut off uh, you know, public investment, health and education spending. It's affected everything in the country and really made it harder for the country to to grow or to meet its uh, millennium development Before goals. I get to you about if you were to advise the IMF what you would have done, let me hear what Therese has to say about what you're saying about Jamaica. I come from it from a very different perspective. Um, when I first started my fund career, I started as the desk economist on Jamaica when Jamaica was in a, the very last program before there was a long hiatus with no pro fund program. Inflation used to be up to 108% uh, per annum. Um, now inflation is in single digits. 
uh, Mark is right to point out that the debt service burden on Jamaica has been high for a long period of time. But I think we've got to look at you know, where Jamaica is coming from over this period. Jamaica's had a long history with the fund since probably 1974 with fund programs in and out. Um, Jamaica's economy has been beset with lots of problems, structural problems, some of the same issues that are arising now in Greece and in Europe in the periphery have to do with structural issues related to the size of government and um, inefficiencies in state-owned enterprises and so on. And these problems have been accumulating in Jamaica over a long period of time. Um, abstracting from the current global crisis over the last two years, I think if you look at the progress that has been made in Jamaica under the funds program since they started, beginning with the debt exchange, it's been positive. Mr. Weisberg and I were having a discussion just now. Jamaica is now starting to experience a little bit of, of economic growth. Still small, but we expect the economy to grow by maybe 1% to 2% this year, which is fairly unusual given what's happening in the rest of the region where, I mean, there's been a collapse in output in the Caribbean generally, with a few exceptions, Guyana being one because it's a commodity producer and it's not so linked in or dependent on, on the services sector, especially tourism. So it's not really tied in with this global um, economic downturn that the world's experienced. Um, I think Jamaica's current set of issues are an accumulation of all of these problems I mentioned earlier. Um, the debt exchange, by the way, is one within the fund. The IMF has been heralded as a very successful debt restructuring. In fact, it's been quoted as being a, a model for perhaps being applied to Ireland or Greece. We certainly um, hope not. But, you know, the counterfactual to a lack of a debt exchange. Can I hear you right? You said the Jamaican experience is the, a model for Ireland and the Greece. Jamaica, the Jamaica debt exchange, exchange, the debt restructuring that they yeah. undertook last year, um, well, 09, uh, 2010, um, it's been a successful model in terms of how they brought the private sector in and all the stakeholders to arrive at a conclusion. I mean, it was very difficult to negotiate the investors from the private sector as well as all the domestic institutions to get to a conclusion to have the debt, um, the interest payment reduced on a wide swath of debt for Jamaica. So um, it's been very successful. It has reduced the debt service burden. Jamaica now has more resources to put into infrastructure and social programs. Um, but Jamaica is going to have to do a lot more work in terms of what it needs to really stimulate um, investment in the wider economy. What's your response, Mark? I think that's completely wrong. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't you know, expect that we would agree. <laughs> I don't. Th first of all, Ireland, Greece, none of those countries will ever accept anything like the debt burden. As I said, it's already twice the debt burden of Greece that they're paying. Uh, a debt restructuring that leaves you with 13% of GDP for debt payment, for interest payments on your debt, is just impossible. They've, you know, you want to use the metaphor that you hear every day on the news, kicking the can down the road. That's the metaphor for that agreement. They have still, uh, you know, the restructuring, they didn't cut any of the principal. So if you have an unpayable debt and you, you don't cut any of the principal, you still have an unpayable debt. And half the debt is going to be uh, due in the next one to five years. Anything happens in the global economy in those the next five years, they could be in very serious, they could have another crisis. They're not going to be able to pay it. This is a case, you know, we have bankruptcy for individuals in the United States, you know. Unfortunately, we don't have that for countries, but that's what you need. When a country has too much debt, you don't squeeze them for years where they can't invest in education or health care or public investment. They're only spending 3% of GDP on public investment and 13% and, and, uh, on interest. That's that's just completely makes it impossible for okay, Jamaica to develop. Okay, let's go back to this kicking and, but the I want to I want to get to the yeah. long term because because Therese raised some interesting questions about what is the long term picture of Jamaica. Okay, first of all, this one quarter of growth that they had in the first quarter of this year is the first quarter of growth in three and a half years, and if you look at the law, and, and it's not even much growth. It's somewhere between we don't even know exactly quarter on quarter because we don't have seasonally adjusted data, but it's somewhere between zero and, a ten, and, 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 and 1% could be almost nothing, okay? Secondly, if you look at, yes, it's true, the point you made, uh, Jamaica was under IMF agreements long-term from 1973 to 96. 
So the IMF laid the foundation for this mess that you see today. And uh, for 20 years, the last 20 years, 2008 back to 1998, 1988, Jamaica grew a total of 14% per person. That's income per person grew by 14% over 20 years. That is a terrible failure. You want to compare it to the rest of the Caribbean? 54%, okay, is what they grew per capita. So more than three times as much. So this has been an economic failure. And by locking in this debt, and by also, by the way, requiring pro-cyclical policies during the most recent recession, okay, the opposite of what we do in the United States, the opposite of what most countries in the world did during the world recession of 2009, what we have is really condemning Jamaica to indefinite period of slow growth and, and, and non-development. I guess Go ahead, my please. response to Mark would be, you know, what is the counterfactual? I mean, in the absence of a debt restructuring, what would have happened? And I've heard Mr. Weisbrot say the last time we met that, you know, they should have defaulted on the debt. But I wonder if you would recommend that for the U.S. or for Greece right now. Well, I have recommended it for Greece. I mean, the U.S. doesn't have a debt problem at all. That's all manufactured. But Greece does have a debt. They have an unpayable debt. And yes, I do. I, well, I'm not only rec they are going to default. Everyone knows that. 95% of investors believe that Greece is going to default. The question is, what are the terms they're going to be to default? If they end up with a Jamaica plan where they're still stuck with an unpayable debt burden, they're going to be in the same boat of, of you know, 16% I, I also would like to correct this, that it's an unpayable debt burden. Jamaica has never not paid any of its debt service. But at before. what cost to the people and the economy? Um, but you the know, human th cost. I mean, if Greece wants to just, you know, close down its whole government and sell the Acropolis, they're, they're, you know, maybe their, their debt burden yeah, could maybe, be payable maybe, too. But maybe we're, we're arguing this. At okay, let's get, to, let's get back a bit to 1996 and um, when the HIPIC program was introduced, the highly indebted poor countries. Why? Hasn't that program been applicable to Jamaica in these times? What has happened? Well, Jamaica is a middle-income country. It's not a low-income country. So Jamaica is considered a middle-income country. Well, now it we is. have I highly though, indebted you know, rich countries. But what is the difference of treatment between the highly indebted poor countries and the highly indebted rich countries? Well, the rich countries are not getting debt relief. So the rich what, what, do, they do, have with, what the do they do with their debt? They will have to restructure their debt. Who as is restructuring well, probably, presently? Well, no one's restructuring presently, but there are negotiations going on right now with Greece and the private sector that possibly they will have to restructure the debt. But they in terms of to. kicking the can down the road, people are saying from all the reports I see from France and, and Russia and um, Al Sahira and so forth, that some very good reports. And what they are saying is that uh, Greece is, is destined to default again. They are going to And default. that's creating a nightmare in the European Union and the European Central Bank. And creating a great question, a number of questions about the euro and the future of the euro. So when you refer to Jamaica kicking the can down the road, are you predicting that Jamaica will be where it is now, five years from now? I just don't see how this goes on indefinitely. I really don't. And again, they have to roll over half of their debt within the, the principal within the next one to five years. Well, if everything's going great in the in Western Hemisphere and the world economy, and you know they don't have any of the kind of shocks that they've had in the past, which is possible, then maybe they'll be able to do that. But still, how can they pay this kind of a debt burden? Again, you're talking about the rich countries, Greece the being the worst of the whole, the, mo the most heavily indebted, paying half of the kind of interest burden that Jamaica is paying. And it's much worse in a, you know, in a developing, country you have uh, you know the just the impact for example out of 77 countries Jamaica showed the largest de decline in coverage for detection and treatment of tuberculosis uh, from 1997 to 2006 it fell from 79 percent to 43 percent this is a a, a real uh, public health uh, disaster and they, they also had decline in, in, in primary school enrollment rates uh, from uh, 91 to 2006 to 2007. So it's development that matters, not debt payment. You know, what, countries have defaulted in the past. Argentina defaulted on its debt at the end of 2001, the biggest sovereign debt default in history. And everybody said, this is going to be the end of you. You'll never borrow again, which is true. They didn't borrow on international markets. But what happened to the people and the economy? 
the economy shrank for one quarter, and then they grew 63% they grew, over they the next grow. six years. Yeah, they and they're still doing very well. They're, and excuse me, Argentina has a host of commodities that happen to be experiencing a, a huge boom in prices right now. And so a lot of what's happened in Argentina since the default. Actually, we did a breakdown has, of their has, GDP has growth. has to do with the improvement in their external current account because it their really, commodity prices are doing so well. It really wasn't. Argentina the, only is the not first six months of, that rec of the six year recovery were led by uh, net exports. The rest Argentina was not. Argentina is growing at the moment at close to 7%. Okay, That's right. There per is annum. one point you made about Jamaica is that, um, and the sense not I got when you compared it with Greece, is that there seemed to have been a political will to summon all the, all the stakeholders to reach some kind of consensus, whereas in Greece we seem to have a problem there. Now, both your opinions on this. What is it in Jamaica that's lacking there? What is it in Greece that is lacking in Jamaica, uh, that, 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 that is not in Jamaica, you know? I mean, my, what, sense, what, what is my, my sense in Jamaica is that, you know, they hit a wall. And so, I mean, there was a lot of consultation about how should we move forward. All right, Mr. Weisbrot's approach would be to Was default. it merely an internal matter, how, how we move forward? We're only in it, it was internal, but I mean, the fund helped as well. I mean, there were lots of public consultations before the fund program came, became uh, signed on the dotted line and so on. There was public consultation with various stakeholders about what's the right approach. But I mean, there weren't too many options. One option was get zero on your investment or get something on your investment if we restructure the debt. So let's stretch it out to 12 years and let's lower the interest rate. And you know, that was more palatable to bondholders than getting zero on it so, or getting nothing back. So I think it was people coming together to not just save their own investments, but also uh, think about really putting Jamaica on uh, on a trajectory to allow them to do the things that, that Mark's talking about. Um, you know, of course, the debt burden is still fairly sizable. Unfortunately, Jamaica is a middle-income country, so it's not going to benefit from HIPEC or debt relief, but it has been getting some debt relief from some of its bilateral creditors. The UK, for example, has from time to time given debt relief, you know, written off um, the debt of Jamaica. So, I mean, it's not impossible that they can get it, but I think, I think it, we would be irresponsible if we, if we start a conversation with sovereign nations that, oh, because your debt burden is high, you know, default and, you know, 10 years down the road, maybe you'll be doing a lot better. Now you can spend money on other things. When, you, when they try to re-enter the international capital market or try to deal with investors again, it, becomes pretty difficult. I think Jamaica wanted to avoid that chaos. And um, given the size of Jamaica in the Caribbean economy, I think that would have been a very disastrous move for them to default. And, and I would hate for any country in the Caribbean to have to experience a default, um, because I think you're looking at exacerbating spreads. Um, so in the case of Jamaica, they may have been paying 15%. It could have gone to 50%. Um, in the future. So you know, I think we're not going to see eye to eye on this. I think Jamaica now has more resources to put into social um, investments, health and education and infrastructure, which they definitely need to do. But Jamaica also needs to do some very difficult work on the structural side. Jamaica's public sector needs reform. Um, and Jamaica needs to make its economy a lot more competitive to allow the private sector to come Mark, in and do the things a, that they a, need a, to do to create the jobs that okay, you're talking about. Can I a model for the other Caribbean countries? Well, first of all, I want to answer one thing. You know, Jamaica's whole uh, fiscal problem has nothing to do with too much spending. Okay, if you look at why they, you know, you look at the last five years, any period you want to look at, the, their, uh, their problems have all been due to either the interest uh, payments or the external shocks that they got during the you know, recession, the drop in remittances, the drop in export earnings. So it isn't a case of overspending. You can't show any year where they missed their targets because the government spent too much money, okay? So it's just, it depends, you know, like I, I don't just, I'm not advising the government. I'm not saying, you know, you should default. What I'm saying is the situation that the international community has trapped Jamaica in right now is is horrible and just because they're accepting it without riots in the streets you know doesn't mean that it's an acceptable thing it's really by any kind of historical or international comparison it's an outrageous example of a country 
being squeezed by a debt burden that is unpayable and is, in, 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 is defeating any kind of chance for the country to grow and develop. And you've got 20 years of hardly any growth. What more experience do you need? 40 years, 50 years? That's the question. So yes, I think any responsible government would look into the other options. And I have to say, you know, you can look at countries that have defaulted on international debt, you know, Argentina, Ecuador in 2007, Russia in 1998. They all did very well, okay? Let, Terry, mm -hmm. let's go a little bit beyond Jamaica. What is the relations now with, Cari uh, with uh, the IMF in the other CARICOM countries? Is there any status report you could give us? Like I mean, there are quite a few board. right now. There are a, a number of uh, programs. Antigua it has a, a standby arrangement with the fund. It's also doing a debt restructuring, a uh, successful debt restructuring. How are they doing, Antigua is doing with their debt They're doing a lot better than I thought they would are be they doing at this point. Are they following lessons from Jamaica or what? They're following lessons from Jamaica and that a debt restructuring was necessary. They were able to do that very successfully. Grenada may be following suit with a debt restructuring because it has a small program as well. Um, when you say a small program, you have an idea about the amount of money we're talking about uh, in terms of millions or what? Uh, yes, but I can't. Okay, yeah, uh, go I mean, ahead. It's, yeah, so there, it's, there it's a multiple of whatever multi Grenada, okay. Grenada's quota is to the fund, but I yeah. can't tell you yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, okay. it's like 50% of uh, okay. quota. So Grenada, Antigua. Grenada, Antigua, St. Kitts and Nevis are in the process of um, negotiating a fund program. I'm surprised you haven't picked on them because they've got the highest debt to GDP ratio in the fund. It's close to 200%. Um, and they're about to go into a similar program with the aim of reducing the debt burden, but also trying to put them on some sort of fiscal uh, sustainability. There is, I know you deal with the Caribbean, but um, if you want to give an opinion, feel free. Mark, mm -hmm. I, I want to go beyond the Caribbean a bit, just to ask you a quick question, because I know you have, uh, you travel extensively in Latin America, and you have, you engage a lot of the governments at, at the professional level. Uh, is there any similar situation to Jamaica? I know we spoke about Argentina presently in Latin America with the fund. There are lots of good stories. Uh, um, yeah, these I countries can, I have can, come out of IMF programs. Yeah. Uh, Nicaragua still has one, um, but a number, Latin America now is benefiting a lot from the commodity boom. The fact that China is growing so fast and needs access to commodities and the prices of commodities now have never been higher in just about, on ev just about every level. So these countries that have a lot of commodities are doing extremely well. I think that's They're right. They're also benefiting from the fact that interest rates in this country and in advanced countries are so low that they've attracted a lot of capital inflows. So actually, Latin American countries have tons of resources, and their big issue right now is how to manage how to manage the wealth that they have. I think that's, that's basically true. I mean, you mentioned Bolivia. That's a good example for my argument. They were under IMF agreements for 20 consecutive years until Evo Morales was elected in 2005 and said no thank you to them. And, uh, and, 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 and by the way, and at, the, at the end of that 20 years, their income per person was lower than it was 27 years prior. Now, since they left, the IMF agreements, they've had the fastest growth they've ever had. They renationalized the hydrocarbons in industry, which the IMF was very much against, and that brought an extra 20% of GDP and revenue uh, to the government, which is enormous. And they've increased social spending, they've increased public investment, they've lowered the retirement age from 65 to 58. So this is why you have a very popular government there. So that's an example of a country leaving the IMF and doing much better. And the IMF, in, in I was there in 2006, they offered them any kind of agreement they wanted and they just said no. And uh, so this was, uh, the, the, this is, but what you're saying is true about them piling up reserves and being able to uh, not have to borrow from the fund. But I wanna say also that during the recession of 2009, because they had no connection to the IMF, all of these countries were able to use counter-cyclical policies like we did in the United States, okay, which had some impact, right? I mean, it's still a weak economy, but we did have a stimulus. And that's what these countries were able to do, and it's the opposite of what Jamaica had to do under the IMF program. Well, again, I, I would disagree. Um, fiscal consolidation doesn't, I mean, fiscal consolidation that, I, that Jamaica is experiencing under the program, which happened to coincide with the global crisis, doesn't necessarily mean that 
what they could spend resources on may not be growth enhancing. I think it's more important for, for Jamaica to try to reduce inflation, try to bring interest rates down to single digits, to make uh, uh, credit more available for, for business. Um, these are really important fundamental uh, indicators that, that any country needs to work on if it wants to grow. So, you know, I, I mean, you're still, you're picking on this Jamaica example. I think you're not, it's not really okay, helping let's, your case Can much we look at the facts? Can we look fact, at the facts Jamaica, for a moment? I mean, any, the average Jamaica would tell you they'd rather inflation be 6% than 100%. Well, I don't think those are the alternatives. And uh, let's look at the actual facts. What happened during the downturn in Jamaica? The government raised interest rates under the IMF program uh, from something like uh, 7 to 21 percent to keep the currency from, from falling. Some economists would say they would have been better off letting the currency fall. Okay? And it has. And, and, and it's now stabilized. Yes. But the point is that had a, a negative effect on the economy. And they cut, uh, they, they did fiscal tightening of about 1.9 percent of GDP. Okay? Again, the opposite of what most countries in the world did and what most economists believe you want to do. The IMF should be there to help a country like Jamaica do what the United States can do during a recession. I mean, we don't always do what we're supposed to do because of our own stupidity, but, when, but we at least can engage in expansionary fiscal and monetary policy to counteract a recession. The IMF should be providing reserves to Jamaica and other countries uh, to enable them to do that during a recession so that they can grow and maintain higher levels of employment. Well, Mark and Therese, thank you very much for a very insightful and great discussion. I'm on the board of New Rules for Global Finance, and we monitor the IMF and World Bank, and I've been doing it for labor since 1998. I've seen the Asian crisis. There was a time a few months ago, a year or two, when we thought that the IMF would not have any work to do because nobody was borrowing. But suddenly, the crisis has developed in the developed countries and people are going back to the IMF and they are borrowing. So the IMF is back in business. So we have to continue monitoring what is the impact of all these policies in the Caribbean. There are many lessons, not only in the developed countries, but in the developing countries. So we look forward in Carib Nation to continue monitoring the IMF as we have done since the Asian crisis. For Carib Nation, thank you. I'm Paul Nehru Tennessee.